The title for our lesson tonight is Faith Without Works is Dead. And uh, some of you might have put two and two together and you started to ask yourself, hey, where's the PowerPoint? Doesn't Justin always teach with PowerPoint? No, I, I don't always teach with PowerPoint. And before you, you leave and you try to head for the doors, uh, this was just a busy week and so it was a little bit harder to put the PowerPoint together. But also, um, I didn't know where I would need to end with this passage or where I would need to speed up um, because it is such a long uh, text. And so I wanted to have a little bit more freedom. Uh, just keep in mind, we're going to go through James chapter 2, verse 14, and we're going to get all the way through the end of the chapter. And so just a little perspective, uh, when Pastor Tom taught these verses on a Sunday morning, they took him four Sundays. All right, he was able to spend four Sundays on this, and I've, I've got one Sunday night. And I'm not looking for you to compare between the two. What I'm saying is if I miss something, go back online. And we even have lovely people that transcribe his lessons. I don't know who you people are, but awesome. That is wonderful. I benefited from that myself in my study time. So go back. And if there is something that you're, man, I wish Justin would have gone, you know, 75 more minutes on that. You're probably alone because everyone else... Didn't hope that same thing. You can go online and you can catch up with those things. Also, when it comes to the outline, the outline's pretty simple tonight. I have two main points. Uh, the first one would be James's argument, where I just want to take a, a broad look at this passage and see what James is seeking to accomplish. And shocker, it is faith without works is dead. You, you've already seen that because that is the title. And uh, the other one is James's approach. And uh, there are many sub points to James's approach, um, but I want to look at his argument first, all right? But uh, please join with me in prayer as we ask the Lord to bless this time together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to open up your word. And we are so thankful that James is such a beautiful book, and it speaks so clearly to such fundamental truths that we as followers of Jesus, we need to understand and we need to teach, and we need to proclaim, and we need to hold others accountable too. Thank you for this wonderful time together. Give us clarity of mind to understand, and just please guide me with your Holy Spirit as we go through this passage. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Keeping in mind the book of James was written to Jewish believers who had been scattered abroad. Most likely they were Jews that were part of uh, the church in Jerusalem. And when the persecution came in, they, they scattered abroad. And now James, who is the leader of that church, is now reaching out to them and writing to them key things. Uh, the theme of the book uh, is either real faith works you could say it that way. Um, what you claim needs to be backed up by what you do. Or you could also call it the effects of real saving faith. If you have real saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then it should be evident. All right? It should be evident. And it's perfect when we get today with faith without works is dead. Because how many people out there honestly say, oh, I love Jesus. Oh, I'm a part of Jesus' church. Oh, I was baptized in the name of Jesus. But when you look at their life, you see a, a complete and utter lack of any morality whatsoever. You see no devotion to the word of God. You see no devotion to the church. And that faith cannot save. That head knowledge that is there cannot save because faith without works is dead. And as we look at um, James's argument, faith without works is dead, there's a few words I want us just to point out. In verse 14, it says, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works, can that faith save him? So in verse 14, we see uh, the idea of useless. False faith, faith without works is useless. Um, looking at verse 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is what? Dead being by itself. So not only is faith with no works useless, it is also a, a dead faith. There's nothing it can accomplish. There's nothing it can do. And then in verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is what? Useless. So we get useless again. And then we skip all the way to the end of this passage in verse 26. And it says, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. So James's argument is very clear and we need to just ask ourselves for a moment, why is James spending time 
on this argument. Uh, it fits into the broader picture of the book, yes. It, it, it drives home his point, the effects of real saving faith. But there are two main reasons why he's communicating this to these people. One is to cover salvation again, to reiterate to them, you are not saved by your works. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And the work that Christ did on the cross completely secured your salvation you, when you repent and trust in him. But if you are saved, you must have works that accompany that salvation. The idea is foreign to the Bible that you can just say you love Jesus but not prove that love to him and to others. Unfortunately, for some reason in Christian circles, this is, this is uh, debated. Um, but when you look at the totality of Scripture and you know that every tree bears, every good tree bears what? Good fruit. And the bad tree bears what? Bad fruit. I mean, we've known that since elementary school. And the one who says, I'm a good tree, I love Jesus, but you're producing bad fruit, then that is not a faith that will save you. We understand that everyone is in Christ is a new creation. Old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. So it's this idea of really, if you are saved, there should be works produced with that faith. But then this, the other aspect of this on why J James is spending time in this argument is sanctification. It's sanctification. Remember in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, Paul's, uh, uh, you know, kind of coming up with this um, hypothetical argument of the, shall we sin so that grace will increase? You know, the fact that God saves us by his grace means that he's gracious and loving and generous. And if we just go on continuing sinning, doesn't that mean he's more gracious and more loving and more caring? And, and, and Paul says, may it never be. And so the reality is, as Christians, we need to look at this passage and say, where is my faith? My faith is in Jesus Christ, so I will work for him. My life is for him, for his glory, and to do the deeds that he is what? prepared for me to do. Ephesians 2.10, I am his workmanship and I am created in Christ Jesus to live a long and happy life and do whatever I want and have lots of ease and comfort. No, I'm created in Christ Jesus to do the good, we, the good works that Christ has prepared beforehand so that I may walk in them. So as we sit here tonight, I, I don't know necessarily where all of you are. Maybe you need to hear the message of salvation, that if you have a, a head knowledge of Jesus Christ that gets you nowhere, it has to be the heart. You must repent and believe in Christ and submit to his lordship. And, and it, when you are saved, you will produce the fruit that keeps to repentance. Maybe that's where you're at tonight. Maybe you've been f uh, fooling everyone that you know. Or it could be that you're a Christian tonight and you just need to be spurred on to love and good deeds. Either way, this passage will accomplish both of those things. The second part of our outline and what we'll spend the majority of our time on is James's approach. We know what he's communicating. Faith without works is dead. And how is he going to do this? How is he going to tackle it? Well, A, he's going to give three rhetorical questions. And you're like, oh, I get it. I can do this outline. One, James's argument. Two, James's approach. You even gave me the letter A. I'm going to write A, and it's three rhetorical questions, so I already know my three subpoints. They're just the questions. It's amazing how that works out. Nice and simple. And you know what a rhetorical question is, right? Dad's driving the family on a vacation, and he turns back to the child that's disobeying and says, do you want me to turn this car around? Clearly, the kid doesn't want his dad to do that. And the dad doesn't want to do it either, but he, he has a point, right? He, you need to stop what you're doing. Do you want me to pull this thing over? Oh, no, I do not. All right, and, and you already know that. It's the same thing with Romans 6. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? Paul wasn't thinking, I'm gonna just lob this baby out there and see what they say. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Let's do it, woo -hoo. No, he, he already knows the answer. And here, James knows the answer to these things. But in asking the question, he, he makes it clear and, and obvious and evident to them. The first one would be, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says that he has faith, but he has no works? And this is the first part of chapter 14. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? The, the word use is translated as advantage or a, a help, 
assistance. You know, as parents, you have to weigh out what tasks and chores to give your kids, right? Because you can't say when they're four, go mow the yard. Because they may go out there and do something with the lawnmower, but it's not going to be good for them or for you. You have to wait until they're older so that it is what? Useful. So it is advantageous. There are things that they actually can accomplish in that. Uh, What use is it? What advantage? What help is it? If someone says he has faith, but he has no works, that same word use is in 1 Corinthians 15, 32, when Paul is, has people questioning the resurrection. And Paul says, look, if from human motives, I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? What is the use? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we may die. And, and Paul's point is Christ has been resurrected. There is a resurrection. So the use and the profit is great. What use is it if you have something that doesn't work? I mean, if you have a car, it can look all shiny and nice and new. But if it doesn't run when you turn that ignition, what use is it? If you have a fridge, but it doesn't keep things cold, It's not useful to you. There's no advantage to it. If you have a phone that doesn't ring when people call you, that might be kind of nice, actually. All right, I I might kind of sign up for that one. Uh, What good is it to have a teenage son that doesn't mow your yard? What? There's all these things that if there's no use to them or help or advantage, we, we wouldn't pursue that. We wouldn't keep doing those types of things. But there are people filling this world that say they have a faith in Jesus Christ. But there is no fruit in keeping with repentance. What use is that faith? You know, you see Seth up here doing a great job, and I don't know if you call him Seth or if you call him Bigelow or you call him Biggs or Mr. Bigelow. I don't know, whichever one it is. Most of the time I call him Biggs. I think that works well. What if you said, I would love to be in the praise band? I would love to to do that. You know what? He'd love to have you try out for that. And he asks you, what what instrument do you play? Well, I I play the guitar. And before you jump up here and try to steal Randy's spot, what do you think Seth's going to have you do? He's going to, you're going to fight Randy. That's how it works. Okay. That's pretty much, if you've never, you've never worked with bigs in the music industry, that's what works. No, he's going to have you actually play the guitar. Prove it to me that you can actually play. I keep asking him, when's my solo? Every time that order of service comes out on Sunday, I don't see my name next to that solo. And he said, well, if you would just try out and prove that you can sing. And I said, well, that's just not going to happen. So there is not going to be any solo. What if you had a friend, but that friend never talked to you? And that friend never spent time with you? And that friend never did anything with you? Would you really consider that person a friend? Here tonight, when we relate that to God. Yes, I love you, God. I have faith in you, Jesus Christ, but I never pray to you except when I'm in need. And I never sit down and open up your holy book and learn. And I never worship you with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind. I never spend that deep, quiet fellowship with you. I don't keep your law. I ignore what the things are going. Are are you kidding me? Do you think God considers you his friend? Absolutely not. Roman is clear. You you are not his friend. You are his enemy. Jesus told his followers, those who are my friends are the ones who do what? The will of my father. And if you claim that you have a faith, but there is no fruit there, that faith is useless. At the end of that verse, we get our second rhetorical question. He says, can that faith save him? Can that faith save him? The word can, is it able? Does it have power to be able to do that thing? Uh, and, And Paul, we already know he's communicated to us that his works could not save him. You remember Philippians 3, verses 4 through 9. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has put a mind to confidence in the flesh, I far more, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews as to the law of Pharisee, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is found in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted lost for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. 
It may be found in him not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is what? Through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. When, it, when you look at the word can, able or power, Paul looked at his life and realized that his good deeds, his good works had no power to save him. On the other side, there are plenty of examples of people that claim they know God and they say they have the faith, but that faith can't save them because it's not accompanied with the genuine works that goes along with the saving faith. We don't have time to turn there, but you're probably familiar in Acts chapter 8 with Simon the sorcerer who heard the message, who heard the good news, and what did he do? He responded, he believed, did he not? But when push came to shove, did he really understand what he was believing? No, he, he tried to buy the Holy Spirit from the apostles. I want that power. And they called him out and said, you are in the, the, the bitterness of the bondage of your sin and you must repent still. The one who says he has faith, but that faith does not work, is not saved. Not only, here is the danger, not only does that faith not save, it deludes. Look back at James chapter 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. There are lots of people that are out there that think they know Jesus and they hear that word, but they don't do that word. And, and what do they have? They have a false sense of security. Maybe they were baptized at one point. Maybe they walked an aisle. Maybe they, they signed a card or whatever it may be and they're holding on to that experience. Someone prayed a prayer with them or whatever it may be, but they have never truly given their life to Jesus Christ. That faith cannot save them. It's like a, a life preserver that's made of concrete. That life preserver that someone throws to you when you're drowning and you're like, ah, oh, yes, and then that baby, you cling on to that and what does it do? It takes you to the bottom. It would be like a gun that explodes in your face. It is no help to you whatsoever. I'd like to, we're so close to Hebrews. I'd like to just flip over to Hebrews chapter 11. And I know you're familiar with this, but I want to, over, want to go over what faith is and we can see how it's exhibited throughout Hebrews chapter 11. Verse one, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not seen. For by it, the men of old, what? Gained approval. Whoa, whoa, what are we talking about here? God being a righteous and holy God, man being a sinful, wretched creation, is separated from God. And the men of old, whether it's Moses or Abraham or, or David, any single one of them, they gained approval with God, not by their good deeds. They gained approval by faith. And Hebrews 11 goes on to speak of that. Go down to chapter, or verse six. And without faith, it is impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. You see, true faith has the right content. It is understanding that Jesus lived a perfect life, that Jesus died on the cross in your place, that Jesus rose again from the dead, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and that he and only he can provide the sacrifice necessary to save you from your sin. If your faith is defined in a different way than that, then it is a false faith. But not only that, if your faith doesn't exhibit the characteristics of the hall of faith in Hebrews 11, then it is a false faith and it cannot save you. We see what Daniel did and what Joseph did and what Rahab did and what Gideon did and on and on and on. How these people who say they believed in God, they then what they served God. You say you believe in God, right? Do you serve him? Is your life about him? Is he your Lord and master or is he just a convenience to you? The third rhetorical question found in verses 15 through 17. It says, if a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, 
and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? James isn't fishing for an answer here, people. He knows the answer, and I love what he does here. If anyone starts to kind of argue with him, well, no, I don't really see that. He has this illustration, and it's like, oh, yes, clearly, that friend is not a friend. They have someone in need. They see a, a, it's not just a one-time thing. It's a daily need. These people are coming to them. They're in desperation, and what are you going to do? You're going to turn them away, but in turning them away, you're going to say, man, I hope everything works out for you. I really do. I'm praying for you. Good luck with that. No, 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 no. That's not what a friend does. The friend would say, come on in. Come sleep on my couch. Come eat my food. Come wear our extra clothes and things along those. Whatever it may be, the world looks at this and says, logically, if there is someone that you would say you loved, you would take care of them in a time of need. Well, in the same way, if you say you love Jesus, you have a relationship with him, you do the deeds that he has called you to do. Keep your finger here in James chapter 2 and please flip over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. The book of John, the theme are the tests of eternal life. Do you really love Jesus? Do you really know Jesus? Well, here are the things that your life should exhibit habitually. In one of them, it says in verse 17 of chapter 3, whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? And do you see what John did? He made a connection here. You see that person, it's not just that you don't love them, you don't love God. Because God's commandments are summarized in love God and love who? People. And if you don't love that person, you don't love God. And it says, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him. And whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment, that we believe in the, his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. And the one who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And we know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So John is, is uh, he's in sync with James. It's very clear. If you say you love God, then you will love people. You will do the deeds that you have been called to. And he goes on to say this with a concluding thought. He says, even so faith if it has no works, is dead being by itself. Many of you may know someone similar to, to Daniel Doriani's truck driver, and it's someone that he writes of in his commentary. And it says that uh, when Doriani was co in college in the 1970s, he would hitchhike from time to time. And he caught a long ride with a truck driver, and I'm not, um, kids at home, I'm not saying you should do this. I'm just saying that's what they did back then, all right? He says that, he had talked to this truck driver about faith in Jesus Christ and they had an intense conversation about the Bible and about faith. And after about two hours, the tr truck driver stated his problem. Look, hey, I understand that Jesus is the son of God. I know I'm a sinner and I believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. But I am a married man and I am a cross-country driver and I have girlfriends in every cities, and I don't want to give them up. That man does not understand that Jesus is the Son of God. He does not understand that he is a sinner, and he does not understand or believe that Jesus died on the cross for his sins, or he would give up that trash, and he would follow Jesus with a whole heart. And that's the way it works for the Christian. You say you love Jesus, you follow Jesus. And if you refuse to follow, then you have revealed that that faith cannot save you. That faith is useless. That faith is, in fact, a dead faith. 
Well, then we transition on from verses 18 through 26. We're going to look at three revealing illustrations. And convenient for James to do that for us, right? Three rhetorical questions and three revealing illustrations that he's going to use to drive home his point here. And we see in verse 18, first of all, in verses 18, 19, and 20, we see number one, the negative illustration of demons, the negative illustration of demons. He goes on and he says, but someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Now, this passage, these verses are actually quite complicated. When you, when you read through them the first time, you're like, oh, yeah, I got it. Then then you read through it a second time and you say, oh, no, I don't. I don't have it. Because there's something happening here and we need to figure out who this objector is. It says, but someone may well say, and even good and godly men, uh, great commentators, men of the faith, they differ on who this objector is. Some that you would know well would say that the objector is James himself, that James himself is making himself the objector in this hypothetical circumstance. Well, I find that to be odd when you look at the context and you start looking at this. Some would say that this is no, not James, because it says, but someone. All right, but James doesn't say, but myself. He says, but someone. It's a friend of James, and it's actually a good objector who's kind of pointing something out to push James's uh, thought process along. Well, actually, when you, when you look at it, you see that word, but, all right? It's in counter to what James has been teaching this whole time. He's teaching them some, something, and someone else says, um, but, excuse me, I have a better idea. I have another interpretation, but there's an adversative here. So whatever is being said it has to go against the grain of what James is communicating. But someone may well say, well, what is he saying? All right, now, this is also difficult to look at. Where do the quotation marks end? All right, keeping in mind that in the Greek, there are no quotation marks to help us. And so the, the English translators have, some would put them earlier, some would put them over the whole sentence and whatever it may be. But we know that they are not saying. Let's answer what they are saying by first looking at what they aren't saying. Maybe you've heard that before, right? They are not saying, they are not saying, show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. How do we know that's not what they're saying? That's the exact same thing James has been saying this whole time. The whole time James has been saying, show me your faith without the works. It's not real faith, it's dead. And I will show you my faith by my works. So we know that that's not what they're saying. So the objector can't be saying that part. So we boil it down to the first aspect. You have faith and I have works. They are saying you have faith and I have works. And we don't know exactly what they're meaning by this or where they're going, but we do know that there is a misunderstanding with this objector when it comes to the idea of works and faith. We know, understanding the Bible, that you are saved by faith. And if you have faith in Christ, you will produce works in keeping with repentance. But others would believe you have a little bit of faith, you have a little bit of works, and boom, away you go. That would be the what? The Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church would use these same verses to say, mm, this is how things work. You don't just have faith, you also have to have works, and you put those together, and boom, there you go. Or it could be that this person is, is the objection, which would go along with the context, is saying faith without works can equal salvation. Either way, a wise man once said, now having made his point, what does James expect? He expects those who keep on saying that they're Christians, who keep on saying they have faith, but keep on having no obedience, he expects them to argue with him. And yes, I did copy and paste that off of the transcript from one of Tom's lessons. He's saying, as I'm going through this argument, someone's going to stand up and say, I'm not buying it. I can be saved without works. 
They say, I know a guy who one day long ago went to the revival and walked an aisle and made a profession and he was baptized and his mom was there and I know this person said a prayer. I know that they're saved. I don't care that the rest of their life has been living in abject rebellion to the Lord. I know this. I have this experience. And what you have to do is you have to go to the word of God and say, that is not what the the Bible teaches. That's inconsistent with the word. The objector is saying something different than what James is saying. And so James goes on to correct him. And he says, look, you show me your faith without the works. I'll show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe, and what do they do? They, they shudder. They shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow? So he's calling the objector a, a foolish fellow. That faith without works is useless. I mean, come on, the demons know who God is. They, they would quickly recognize who Jesus was. Remember, they would bow down before him. They would call out, have mercy on us, son of the most high. They understood who he was, but there was never a, a, a true faith and repentance that's there. It's, it's not allowable for them as, as fallen demons that's in there. There's that head knowledge there, but there's not a submission that's going on. In the same way, if you have a head knowledge of who Jesus is, but you don't submit your life to him, that faith is without works, and that faith is what? Useless. Well, number two, we see the positive illustration of a patriarch. All right, so we see the, the, the negative side. The demons have, uh, you know, that, that uselessness that's there. The person that would get have knowledge to God but not submit to him, it's useless. But here is a positive illustration. And this too, this can get quite sticky unless you're using a good hermeneutics and you're reading carefully and you're understanding what's going on here. Continuing on his argument, he says in verses 21 through 24, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. And some of you are right there thinking Martin Luther is rolling over in his grave. James, you just said, what? You just said that Abraham, the patriarch of the nation of Israel, is justified by his works? And the Catholics go, Woo-hoo-hoo, this is getting interesting now. Well, keep reading. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. It was completed. What James is expressing here, he had the faith. And without the faith, the work never happens. And the work itself was the evidence of the faith. Can you see faith? Can I look at you and see faith? Your deeds exhibit the faith that is there. It says, in the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And you say, oh, I feel better about this now. It said he believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Is, is James uh, schizophrenic here? Is he confused? No, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit as he's recording these things, and he's writing it down for a reason. In verse 24, you see that a man is justified by, uh-oh, Works and not faith alone. Now I'm really confused. Can we go back to that objector thing? Wasn't that just easier there? Keep in mind what James is teaching here. James is not teaching a salvation based on works. You look at the the totality of the book of James, that's not what he is teaching. But we need to keep in mind, uh, what do you do when you get to a difficult passage? I know what some of you do. You flip to the MacArthur study notes on the bottom. All right, I know that's what you do. And you know what? That's not a bad idea, okay? It's not a bad idea, but you don't want to just take what other, what other people have written and, and use that as gospel truth. Use that, all right? Assist you in that. But what you need to do, the, the first thing, there's, there's something you need to know. There's something you need to understand. There's something you need to do. You need to know the immediate context, all right? You need to know the immediate context. What is James teaching here? Well, this passage is faith without works is what? Dead. So he's going to come up with an illustration of someone who had faith and because of that faith did a work. 
The, the theme of this passage isn't work save you. It's not what he's saying here. He has an argument that he's making, and this is an illustration that's contributing to that. You need to know the immediate context, what's going on there, what's going on in the rest of the chapter, what's going on in the rest of the book. But then you need to understand the ultimate context. So you know the immediate context, and then you understand the ultimate context. If you ever come across a passage that's difficult, you need to look at the rest of the Bible and say, what does the rest of the Bible say about this topic? And you start reaching back into your mind to your Awana days and all of the things, and you say, well, I remember Titus 3.5. You know, he saved us not on the basis of deeds that we have done in righteousness, right? I, yeah, I remember that. I remember Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of works. Oh, yeah, I'm getting this. I, I understand. And nowhere did Jesus ever say, do good works to be saved. He said, believe in me. And then he held them accountable. If you really believe in me, then you will do the things that I have asked for you to do. So the ultimate context about what God teaches about salvation is repentance and belief equals salvation. Works plus faith doesn't equal salvation. Uh, you consider Romans 4. Uh, flip to Romans 4, please. It's an easy one. It's not asking like I'm, you know, you're going to have to find Ezekiel or something like that. Romans 4. Probably some of your Bibles just automatically flop open to Romans by now. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? Oh, here we go. We found, in the ultimate context of the Bible, we found Abraham again. And what's it saying about Abraham? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, this is the same cross-reference that we saw already in James chapter 2. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but what is due. But the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And so clearly, Paul is teaching here, how was Abraham saved? Through faith. He was saved through faith. He was justified through faith. He believed, and it was credited. Well, then we go, you know what? Let's go a little bit further. And we're talking about this Abraham guy. We know what the Bible says about salvation. So clearly this helps us in our interpretation in James chapter two. What about Abraham? What's going on in his life? In the life of Abraham, you have Genesis 12. You have his calling. And Abraham is estimated to be 75 years old when he was called. In Genesis 15, that he believed and it was credited to him as righteousness, all right? That Romans 4 verse right there, that happened in Genesis 15. In Genesis 21, Isaac is born. And Isaac is 100 years old. Or sorry, Isaac. Man, that would be weird. <laughs> Poor baby. You're born as 100. Abraham is 100 years old. Remember, the illustration that uh, James is using when Abraham, our father, was he not justified by works when he offered up Isaac on the altar? So this instance, Abraham had become a Christian, a believer, at least 25 years before, plus whatever the age of Isaac was during this time. So probably, you know, 40, 42, 43, around in there, that's how long he had already been a believer. He had already been credited with righteousness because of his faith. So this work that he's doing wasn't God going, oh, oh, now you're saved. Before I had a question mark, but now you're in, all right? This is, he has faith, so that faith is working with his works to exhibit that. So first of all, we know the immediate context. Secondly, we understand the ultimate context, and then we need to do our homework, and I know that's a, that's, that's a dirty word, isn't it? Homework. And you say, look, Justin, I have a full-time job. I have 12 kids. I don't do homework anymore. All right? I make my kids do homework, and I laugh, and I chuckle as they do that. No, Christian, dive in. Don't just do what someone else is doing. Don't just parrot what someone else tells you. Do the work. And when you look at the word, was not Abraham our father justified. Keep in mind, justified is an English word. This book was written in Greek, and the Greek word, we need to go back to that Greek word and understand it. 
The Greek word can be and is often translated as justified, but it can equally be translated as vindicated. Vindicated, all right? I am the, the youngest of, of four children, okay? And often when I stated my case, when I pleaded with my parents that I was the innocent party, I was often ignored because I often wasn't the innocent party. But there was one particular instance of, of something I'm not going to go into, but I knew it wasn't me. I knew, and it was fighting all words on this. It was not me. And about 20 years later, <laughs> we're talking around the dinner table about this. And finally, my brother said, oh, yeah, that was me. <laughs> I was vindicated. I was proven to be innocent here. I was proven to be justified in my complaint. It had happened. The day had come, and I was so happy. But I don't hold on to it or anything like that. <laughs> Not at all. When it comes to justification, there is an aspect that the word means to declare righteous, and that is accurate, and that is true. But it also means to show to be righteous. That's the vindicated aspect of it. So John MacArthur says in his commentary, James' point is that the overall pattern of Abraham's life, Abraham faithfully vindicated his saving faith through his many good works, above all else, sacrificing Isaac. So look again at the English text in verse 21. Was not Abraham our father vindicated by works when he offered up Isaac on the altar? Oh, Abraham... You believe in a one true God? Really? You believe in that? And he says, so much so that if he commands me to sacrifice my son, I believe in him. And isn't it beautiful that the scripture reveals that Abraham believed that even if God wanted to, he would do what with Isaac? He would raise him from the dead. Abraham said, God, this is a no-brainer to me. I love this son, this one that you, you had me wait 25 years for. I love him with a passion. But I will take that knife and I will slit his throat. I will slay him because I love you more. And I believe in you more. I will do it. That work did not save Abraham. It vindicated him to show that he put his money where his mouth was, that he really did love Jesus. Verse 22, you see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Scripture was fulfilled, which was says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is vindicated by works and not by faith alone. This isn't a twisting or manipulation of the Scripture here. This is just walking through the passage, looking at the immediate context the overall context, and doing our homework. And if we do a little bit of homework here, we understand this, pas this passage so much better. You see that he ends this um, illustration by saying, you see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. He is vindicated by his works. I love this, this quote. It says, because of Abraham's faith in God, he became no longer an enemy, but a friend of God. As God's friend Abraham exhibited a consistent pattern of obedience. Abraham trusted God, therefore Abraham obeyed God. John 15, 14, Jesus says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. And this is the part, I've got two verses left, and I know that the, my time is getting a little close to ending and things along those lines, and I wish I could dive into these a little bit deeper, but I just want to point out the overall structure of what's happening. The third outline point here, the positive illustration of a prostitute. You can't say that often, can you? The positive illustration of a prostitute. Verse 25, in the same way. Woohoo! Okay, you have the, the patriarch of the nation of Israel. And then you have a Gentile harlot. And they got something in common here? Yes, they do. In the same way. Was not Rahab the harlot justified or vindicated by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? 
For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. We remember what Rahab did in the book of Joshua. We remember that she heard the news about Yahweh and about what he did for Yahweh's people and her heart, what, melted. And she placed her faith in the one true God. And as a result of that, when the spies came, she took them in and she hid them. She sided with them. Rahab is chosen for two reasons. First of all, she proves James's argument. She proves James's argument. She didn't have a dead faith. She had a real faith and it was exhibited by her works. But also she provides a compliment and a contrast to Abraham. Okay? This whole um, living out your faith isn't just for the, the upper crust. Is it, it isn't just for the, the super elite Christian. And some will say that. All right? The super elite Christian, the, 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 the dude that's like Abraham. Yeah, yeah, he does that. No, the one who made her money with sexual immorality. When she repented and trusted, she too had the same in the same way. She has the same forgiveness. She has the same righteousness. She has the same consistent patterns of obedience now. Rahab gave up her life to follow after God. Well, in conclusion, I would just like to revisit again why James is spending so much time on this argument. What's he, what's he accomplishing? When it comes to salvation, all right, the two points, salvation and sanctification. If you are here tonight, are you clinging to an event to prove your salvation? Walk in an aisle, sign in a card, being baptized? Is that what you point to? Mom and dad are Christians. I go to a, a good, solid short, a church. Have you deluded yourself into thinking that you're okay? Do you object to such solid, irrefutable truth? If you answered yes to any of those, then you are not in Christ. But the good news is that this very day, if you would understand your wretchedness and your need of a savior and would turn to him, he would completely forgive you. And that salvation would be completely done because it was already paid for on the cross. He will redeem you. If you look at your life and you say, I have a faith, but wow, it is deader than dead. God will make that faith alive and real if you will come to him in repentance and faith. For those of us that are Christians, what do we do here? I think you need to remember a couple of things. Like Abraham, are you not also a friend of God? You have believed in God and your belief has been reckoned as righteousness and now as Abraham was considered a friend of God, isn't that wild? The almighty creator of the universe and Abraham is friends with him? You too, Christian, are a friend of God. And what do you do with your friend? You love your friend. You spend time with your friend. You, you, you seek to please your friend. Like Rahab, do you not remember that you were an utter wretch who has been redeemed? Don't you remember that? Purchased by the blood of Christ, completely dead in your trespasses and sins, and you owe it all to him? your master, your Lord, and, and do you not want to serve him with every ounce of your, your being? Like both Abraham and Rahab, are you not called to be a light to the world? Should you not, with your faith, live it out in such a way that your faith is vindicated so other people can see your love for Jesus and be drawn to that and believe in him as well? James's argument is abundantly clear. Faith without works is dead. If your faith is dead, repent and believe in Christ. If your faith is alive, continue to strive to please your Savior. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I feel that we are even unworthy to read these words written in your holy book through the inspiration of your Holy Spirit. But the reality is, Lord, for those that are in Christ, we have been redeemed and we have been given your righteousness. And you now no longer view us as sinners, but you view us as if we had lived Christ's life. Lord, we are so thankful. We are so thankful. Help us to champion this truth, 
to preach this good news, to hold people accountable, to spread your gospel. And if there's anyone here tonight that still has that dead faith, I ask, Lord, that you would intervene and you would call and draw them to yourself by the work of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the beauty of your word. And it's in your son's name we pray, amen.